Every fact we learn leads us to the learning of another fact. Knowledge is continually increasing. Every talent we cultivate brings to the mind the desire to cultivate another talent. We are subject to the urge of life, seeking expression, which ever drives us on to know more, to do more, and to be more. In order to know more, do more, and be more, we must have more. We must have things to use, for we learn and do and become only by using things. We must get rich so that we can live more. The desire for riches is simply the capacity for larger life seeking fulfillment. Every desire is the effort of an unexpressed possibility to come into action. It is power seeking to manifest which causes desire. That which makes you want more money is the same as that which makes the plant grow. It is life seeking fuller expression. The one living substance must be subject to this inherent law of all life. It is permeated with the desire to live more. That is why it is under the necessity of creating things. The one substance desires to live more in you. Hence, it wants you to have all the things you can use. It is the desire of God that you should get rich. He wants you to get rich because he can express himself better through you if you have plenty of things to use in giving him expression. He can live more in you if you have unlimited command of the means of life. The universe desires you to have everything you want to have. Nature is friendly to your plans. Everything is naturally for you. Make up your mind that this is true. It is essential, however, that your purpose should harmonize with the purpose that is in all. You must want real life, not mere pleasure of sensual gratification. Life is the performance of function, and the individual really lives only when he performs every function, physical, mental, and spiritual, of which he is capable, without excess in any. You do not want to get rich in order to live swinishly, for the gratification of animal desires, that is not life. But the performance of every physical function is a part of life, and no one lives completely who denies the impulses of the body a normal and healthful expression. You do not want to get rich solely to enjoy mental pleasures, to get knowledge, to gratify ambition, to outshine others, to be famous. All these are a legitimate part of life, but the man who lives for the pleasures of the intellect alone will only have a partial life, and he will never be satisfied with his lot. You do not want to get rich solely for the good of others, to lose yourself for the salvation of mankind, to experience the joys of philanthropy and sacrifice. The joys of the soul are only a part of life, and they are no better or nobler than any other part. You want to get rich in order that you may eat, drink, and be merry when it is time to do these things, in order that you may surround yourself with beautiful things, see distant lands, feed your mind, and develop your intellect, in order that you may love men and do kind things, and be able to play a good part in helping the world to find truth. But remember that extreme altruism is no better and no nobler than extreme selfishness. Both are mistakes. Get rid of the idea that God wants you to sacrifice yourself for others, and that you can secure his favor by doing so. God requires nothing of the kind. What he wants is that you should make the most of yourself, for yourself and for others, and you can help others more by making the most of yourself than in any other way. You can make the most of yourself only by getting rich. So it is right and praiseworthy that you should give your first and best thought to the work of acquiring wealth. Remember, however, that the desire of substance is for all, and its movements must be for more life to all. It cannot be made to work for less life to any, because it is equally in all, seeking riches and life. Intelligent substance will make things for you, but it will not take things away from someone else and give them to you. You must get rid of the thought of competition. You are to create, not to compete for what is already created. You do not have to take anything away from anyone. You do not have to drive sharp bargains. You do not have to cheat or to take advantage. You do not need to let any man work for you for less than he earns. You do not have to covet the property of others or to look at it with wishful eyes. No man has anything of which you cannot have the like, and that without taking what he has away from him. You are to become a creator, not a competitor. You are going to get what you want, but in such a way that when you get it, every other man will have more than he has now. I am aware that there are men who get a vast amount of money by proceeding in direct opposition to the statements in the paragraph above, and may add a word of explanation here. 
Men of the plutocratic type, who become very rich, do so sometimes purely by their extraordinary ability on the plane of competition. And sometimes they unconsciously relate themselves to substance and its great purposes and movements for the general racial upbuilding through industrial evolution. Rockefeller, Carnegie, Morgan, et al. have been the unconscious agents of the Supreme in the necessary work of systematizing and organizing productive industry. And, in the end, their work will contribute immensely towards increased life for all. Their day is nearly over, they have organized production, and will soon be succeeded by the agents of the multitude, who will organize the machinery of distribution. The multimillionaires are like the monster reptiles of the prehistoric eras. They play a necessary part in the evolutionary process, but the same power which produced them will dispose of them, and it is well to bear in mind that they have never been really rich. A record of the private lives of most of this class will show that they have really been the most abject and wretched of the poor. Riches secured on the competitive plane are never satisfactory and permanent. They are yours today and another's tomorrow. Remember, if you are to become rich in a scientific and certain way, you must rise entirely out of the competitive thought. You must never think for a moment that the supply is limited. Just as soon as you begin to think that all the money is being cornered and controlled by bankers and others, and that you must exert yourself to get laws passed to stop this process, and so on, in that moment you drop into the competitive mind, and your power to cause creation is gone for the time being. And what is worse, you will probably arrest the creative movements you have already instituted. Know that there are countless millions of dollars worth of gold in the mountains of the earth, not yet brought to light, and know that if there were not, more would be created from thinking substance to supply your needs. Know that the money you need will come, even if it is necessary for a thousand men to be led to the discovery of new gold mines tomorrow. Never look at the visible supply. Look always at the limitless riches in formless substance and know that they are coming to you as fast as you can receive and use them. Nobody, by cornering the visible supply, can prevent you from getting what is yours. So never allow yourself to think for an instant that all the best building spots will be taken before you get ready to build your house, unless you hurry. Never worry about the trusts and combines, and get anxious for fear that they will soon come to own the whole earth. Never get afraid that you will lose what you want because some other person beat you to it. That cannot possibly happen. You are not seeking anything that is possessed by anybody else. You are causing what you want to be created from formless substance, and the supply is without limits. Stick to the formulated statement. There is a thinking stuff from which all things are made, and which, in its original state, permeates, penetrates, and fills the interspaces of the universe. A thought in this substance produces the thing that is imaged by the thought. Man can form things in his thought and, by impressing his thought upon formless substance, can cause the thing he thinks about to be created. Chapter 6 How Riches Come to You When I say that you do not have to drive sharp bargains, I do not mean that you do not have to drive any bargains at all or that you are above the necessity for having any dealings with your fellow men. I mean that you will not need to deal with them unfairly. You do not have to get something for nothing, but can give to every man more than you take from him. You cannot give every man more in cash market value than you take from him, but you can give him more in use value than the cash value of the thing you take from him. The paper, ink, and other material in this book may not be worth the money you pay for it, but if the ideas suggested by it bring you thousands of dollars, you have not been wronged by those who sold it to you. They have given you a great use value for a small cash value. Let us suppose that I own a picture by one of the great artists, which in any civilized community is worth thousands of dollars. I take it to Baffin Ray, and by salesmanship induce an Eskimo to give a bundle of furs worth $500 for it. I have really wronged him, for he has no use for the picture. It has no value to him. It will not add to his life. But suppose I give him a gun worth $50 for his furs. Then he has made a good bargain. He has use for the gun. It will get him many more furs and much food. It will add to his life in every way. It will make him rich. When you rise from the competitive to the creative plane, 
You can scan your business transactions very strictly. And if you are selling any man anything which does not add more to his life than the thing he gives you in exchange, you can afford to stop it. You do not have to beat anybody in business. And if you are in a business which does beat people, get out of it at once. Give every man more in use value than you take from him in cash value. Then you are adding to the life of the world by every business transaction. If you have people working for you, you must take from them more in cash value than you pay them in wages. But you can so organize your business that it will be filled with the principle of advancement, and so that each employee who wishes to do so may advance a little every day. You can make your business do for your employees what this book is doing for you. You can so conduct your business that it will be a sort of ladder, by which every employee who will take the trouble may climb to riches himself, and, given the opportunity, if he will not do so, it is not your fault. And finally, because you are to cause the creation of your riches from formless substance which permeates all your environment, it does not follow that they are to take shape from the atmosphere and come into being before your eyes. If you want a sewing machine, for instance, I do not mean to tell you that you are to impress the thought of a sewing machine on thinking substance until the machine is formed without hands, in the room where you sit, or elsewhere. But if you want a sewing machine, hold the mental image of it with the most positive certainty that it is being made, or is on its way to you. After once forming the thought, have the most absolute and unquestioning faith that the sewing machine is coming. Never think of it, or speak of it, in any other way than as being sure to arrive. Claim it as already yours. It will be brought to you by the power of the supreme intelligence, acting upon the minds of men. If you live in Maine, it may be that a man will be brought from Texas or Japan to engage in some transaction which will result in your getting what you want. If so, the whole matter will be as much to that man's advantage as it is to yours. Do not forget for a moment that the thinking substance is through all, in all, communicating with all, and can influence all. The desire of thinking substance for a fuller life and better living has caused the creation of all the sewing machines already made, and it can cause the creation of millions more, and will, whenever men set it in motion by desire and faith, and by acting in a certain way. You can certainly have a sewing machine in your house, and it is just as certain that you can have any other thing or things which you want, and which you will use for the advancement of your own life and the lives of others. You need not hesitate about asking largely. It is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom, said Jesus. Original substance wants to live all that is possible in you, and wants you to have all that you can or will use for the living of the most abundant life. If you fix upon your consciousness the fact that the desire you feel for the possession of riches is one with a desire of omnipotence for more complete expression, your faith becomes invincible. Once I saw a little boy sitting at a piano, and vainly tried to bring harmony out of the keys, and I saw that he was grieved and provoked by his inability to play real music. I asked him the cause of his vexation, and he answered, I can feel the music in me, but I can't make my hands go right. The music in him was the urge of original substance, containing all the possibilities of all life. All that there is of music was seeking expression through the child. God, the one substance, is trying to live and do and enjoy things through humanity. He is saying, I want hands to build wonderful structures, to play divine harmonies, to paint glorious pictures. I want feet to run my errands, eyes to see my beauties, tongues to tell mighty truths and to sing marvelous songs, and so on. All that there is of possibility is seeking expression through men. God wants those who can play music to have pianos and every other instrument, and to have the means to cultivate their talents to the fullest extent. He wants those who can appreciate beauty to be able to surround themselves with beautiful things. He wants those who can discern truth to have every opportunity to travel and observe. He wants those who can appreciate dress to be beautifully clothed, and those who can appreciate good food to be luxuriously fed. He wants all these things because it is himself that enjoys and appreciates them. It is God who wants to play and sing and enjoy beauty and proclaim truth and wear fine clothes and eat good food. It is God that worketh in you to will and to do, said Paul. The desire you feel for riches is the infinite, seeking to express himself in you as he sought to find expression in the little boy at the piano.
so you need not hesitate to ask largely. Your part is to focalize and express the desire to God. This is a difficult point with most people. They retain some of the old idea that poverty and self-sacrifice are pleasing to God. They look upon poverty as a part of the plan, a necessity of nature. They have the idea that God has finished his work and made all that he can make, and that the majority of men must stay poor because there is not enough to go around. They hold to so much of this erroneous thought that they feel ashamed to ask for wealth. They try not to want more than a very modest competence, just enough to make them fairly comfortable. I recall now the case of one student who was told that he must get in mind a clear picture of the things he desired, so that the creative thought of them might be impressed upon formless substance. He was a very poor man, living in a rented house, and having only what he earned from day to day, and he could not grasp the fact that all wealth was his. So, after thinking the matter over, he decided that he might reasonably ask for a new rug for the floor of his best room, and an anthracite coal stove to heat the house during the cold weather. Following the instructions given in this book, he obtained these things in a few months, and then it dawned upon him that he had not asked enough. He went through the house in which he lived, and planned all the improvements he would like to make in it. He mentally added a bay window here and a room there, until it was complete in his mind as an ideal home, and then he planned its furnishings. Holding the whole picture in his mind, he began living in the certain way, and moving towards what he wanted, and he now owns the house, and is rebuilding it after the form of his mental image, and now, with still larger faith, he is going to get greater things. It has been unto him according to his faith, and it is so with you and with all of us. Chapter 7. Gratitude the illustrations given in the last chapter will have conveyed the fact that the first step towards getting rich is to convey the idea of your wants to the formless substance. This is true, and you will see that in order to do so, it becomes necessary to relate yourself to the formless intelligence in a harmonious way. To secure this harmonious relation is a matter of such primary and vital importance that I shall give some space to its discussion here, and give you instructions which if you will follow them, will be certain to bring you into perfect unity of mind with God. The whole process of mental adjustment and atonement can be summed up in one word, gratitude. First, you believe that there is one intelligent substance from which all things proceed. Second, you believe that this substance gives you everything you desire. And third, you relate yourself to it by a feeling of deep and profound gratitude. Many people who order their lives rightly in all other ways are kept in poverty by their lack of gratitude. Having received one gift from God, they cut the wires which connect them with Him by failing to make acknowledgment. It is easy to understand that the nearer we live to the source of wealth, the more wealth we shall receive. And it is easy also to understand that the soul that is always grateful lives in closer touch with God than the one which never looks to Him in thankful acknowledgment. The more gratefully we fix our minds on the Supreme when good things come to us, the more good things we will receive, and the more rapidly they will come. And the reason simply is that the mental attitude of gratitude draws the mind into closer touch with the source from which the blessings come. If it is a new thought to you that gratitude brings your whole mind into closer harmony with the creative energies of the universe, consider it well, and you will see that it is true. The good things you already have have come to you along the line of obedience to certain laws. Gratitude will lead your mind out along the ways by which things come, and it will keep you in close harmony with creative thought and prevent you from falling into competitive thought. Gratitude alone can keep you looking towards the all and prevent you from falling into the error of thinking of the supply as limited, and to do that would be fatal to your hopes. There is a law of gratitude, and it is absolutely necessary that you should observe the law if you are to get the results you seek. The law of gratitude is the natural principle that action and reaction are always equal and in opposite directions. The grateful outreaching of your mind in thankful praise to the Supreme is a liberation or expenditure of force. It cannot fail to reach that to which it is addressed and the reaction is an instantaneous movement towards you. 
Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. That is a statement of psychological truth. And if your gratitude is strong and constant, the reaction in formless substance will be strong and continuous. The movement of the things you want will always be towards you. Notice the grateful attitude that Jesus took, how he always seemed to be saying, I thank thee, Father, that thou hearest me. You cannot exercise much power without gratitude, for it is gratitude that keeps you connected with power. But the value of gratitude does not consist solely in getting you more blessings in the future. Without gratitude, you cannot long keep from dissatisfied thought regarding things as they are. The moment you permit your mind to dwell with dissatisfaction upon things as they are, you begin to lose ground. You fix attention upon the common, the ordinary, the poor, and the squalid and mean, and your mind takes the form of these things. Then you will transmit these forms or mental images to the formless, and the common, the poor, the squalid, and mean will come to you. To permit your mind to dwell upon the inferior is to become inferior and to surround yourself with inferior things. On the other hand, to fix your attention on the best is to surround yourself with the best and to become the best. The creative power within us makes us into the image of that to which we give our attention. We are thinking substance, and thinking substance always takes the form of that which it thinks about. The grateful mind is constantly fixed upon the best. Therefore, it tends to become the best. It takes the form or character of the best and will receive the best. Also, faith is born of gratitude. The grateful mind continually expects good things, and expectation becomes faith. The reaction of gratitude upon one's own mind produces faith, and every outgoing wave of grateful thanksgiving increases faith. He who has no feeling of gratitude cannot long retain a living faith, and without a living faith you cannot get rich by the creative method, as we shall see in the following chapters. It is necessary, then, to cultivate the habit of being grateful for every good thing that comes to you, and to give thanks continuously. And because all things have contributed to your advancement, you should include all things in your gratitude. Do not waste time thinking or talking about the shortcomings or wrong actions of plutocrats or trust magnets. Their organization of the world has made your opportunity. All you get really comes to you because of them. Do not rage against corrupt politicians. If it were not for politicians, we should fall into anarchy, and your opportunity would be greatly lessened. God has worked a long time and very patiently to bring us up to where we are in industry and government, and he is going right on with his work. There is not the least doubt that he will do away with plutocrats, trust magnets, captains of industry, and politicians as soon as they can be spared. But in the meantime, behold, they are all very good. Remember that they are all helping to arrange the lines of transmission along which your riches will come to you, and be grateful to them all. This will bring you into harmonious relations with the good in everything, and the good in everything will move toward you.